Hi, I'm Dr. Rebecca Whittington and I'm here from Leeds Trinity University. I'm very, very pleased to be welcoming Laura Collins, the editor of the Yorkshire Evening Post, to our very, very first session of Journalism and Media Week 2020, which we're holding live um, and online for the first time ever. So welcome, Laura. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's nice to be back in my old stomping ground. Yep, because of course you're alumni from Leeds Trinity University. Can you tell us what it was that you studied here? So I studied English and media because believe it or not, there wasn't a journalism qualification as such when I first uh, studied at Trinity, which must have been in about 2003. So it, it, it does make me feel a little bit old, I won't lie. <laughs> Well, if, if um, those people that are watching, do get your questions in for Laura now. Um, if you just type your questions into the comments section on YouTube or Facebook, um, we'll be able to have the opportunity at the end of our conversation to actually get some of those questions answered by Laura. Um, and Laura, you did do an MA here afterwards, didn't you as well? Yes, so I did my postgraduate with uh, you guys. I did my master's with you guys. So really, you know, I've been through, I guess, the Trinity journey, journey if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're so pleased to have you back. And what a brilliant first guest um, for Journalism and Media Week. And I guess I wanted to kind of start off by asking you about this first year, because it's been your first year of editorship. And my goodness, what a year you've had. Um, I think it started off with the uh, uh, the elections, the uh, national elections, and then we've obviously had Brexit as running along as an undercurrent with all of this, and then not to forget the small um, the small pandemic that we've been facing this last year, including the breaking news from over the weekend, which has obviously had a huge impact on Leeds and the areas that you serve. Can you tell us more about it? I mean, I won't lie, Rebecca, it feels like we've had pretty much everything and the kitchen sink thrown at us over the last year. So I was sort of reflecting on when I first got the job as editor, which was a year ago. And I remember sort of sitting there at the time and it was just at the time that Leeds United uh, was celebrating its centenary and thinking, of the, I guess that real weight of responsibility about how do you cover something as big as Leeds United being a hundred years old when it means so much to the city, it means so much to fans. It is very much the core of Leeds, it's fair to say. And I remember having this enormous duty thinking, right, how on earth do we cover this? How do we do it justice? And how do we, I guess, compact all of that history into the space of a week? And at the end of the week, I remember sort of like sitting in front of my computer and finding the words to say about, you know, what does this first week as being an editor mean to me? And it was really tough to put that down in words, but then nobody could have foreseen what was going to happen next. So we get the centenary out of the way and then there's the small matter of the election. And yeah. who could have ever predicted that the Yorkshire Evening Post would have found itself, I guess, in the centre of just what was an incredible fake news scandal that not only caused ripples in this country, but beyond as well, it almost ended up going to on the global map the evening post all over just a really simple story of a boy who was sleeping on the hospital floor when his mum took him into a and &E. And I remember sort of seeing the messages starting to ping up on my phone after we'd published the story with people sort of questioning and like trying to clarify what had happened. And on the back of that, what we ended up finding ourselves was almost caught in this storm of people saying that actually this is fake news, this hasn't happened, this has happened, this has happened. People were calling in to question our integrity as journalists and it, it found us very much in this position where we as a title put our heads above the parapet and actually we were forced to defend our journalism like we've never been forced to before because you know, people do have the freedom to read what they want. They have the freedom to believe what they want. And, you know, it's then, I guess you can see why it's so hard for people to almost discern the truth from the lies. So what we found was just streams and streams of tweets, messages with um, the standard response about, you know, my friend works at Leeds Hospital and this is this and this is this. And what we actually had to do was come out and say, look, the information we've published is correct, it is true. 
and we as responsible publishers before we hit that publish button or carry under any, anything under our masthead you know we double check we triple check we want to make sure that this is right and there's no way that we'd put something out there into the open without that verification and then well effectively what happened was that story became nothing more than a political football quite frankly mm -hmm. It did, didn't it? Because Boris Johnson um, was asked about that, wasn't he? And obviously this was before he was um, made prime minister. Um, but, you know, he was being questioned about it. It's, you know, it was it was being talked about in Westminster. And like you say, it really was a political football. But that also, I would say, put you in the spotlight very, very early on in your editorship. Um, and you had to stand up and, and defend journalism and defend the Yorkshire Evening Post. And um, that must have been quite scary <laughs> in some ways, I guess. Yes. You know, it is really tough putting yourself out there. I think more so, particularly as a young woman, um, because, you know, I think people see young women as, I guess, easy targets, especially so young women in power. Um, so it was incredibly tough putting yourself out there. But actually, if I didn't put myself out there and if I didn't defend what we were doing, there was that real danger that then that very vocal minority would just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And if I don't stand up for what our team are doing and for journalism, then who else would? Because, you know, there's a real danger that without us putting our heads up above the parapet, that it would have just become background noise. And, you know, who would have then trusted what we published thereafter? You know, that was incredibly important and something we didn't take lightly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can understand that. And then obviously, uh, you've basically then, since then, obviously had all these very challenging circumstances where trust in news actually is never been so important, has it? And and you've had to carry on and, and provide trusted journalism and trusted news in what must have been very challenging times for you and your team um, as well, because we're all people, we're all living through the pandemic. Can you tell us a bit about how you've managed that? Yes, so I think when we look at trust, there was a really interesting um, report that came out at the back end of last year from the Ed Edelman Global Trust Index. And basically it said that three and four people are really worried about fake news. And there was this real, I guess, question that was put to people in that, you know, two thirds of people didn't really have the confidence that the current leadership would be able to address the challenges that we face. So this was looking in particular at things like Brexit and the political challenges. And I think it, you know, gives that real stark awakening about, you know, why when it comes to say like politicians, for example, you know, they really need to ask themselves the question about why do so many people trust them so little? So then it gets you thinking about, you know, well, how does the media then fare within this? And I think what we've certainly seen, particularly on the back of the pandemic, is that real important local news, that trusted news has never been more important. And actually there was some research from PAMCO earlier this year that said that 71% of people uh, trust what they see in news brands. And this is compared to say like social media, for example, where only 35% think that social media is a trustworthy source of news. So it's almost looking at, you know, why is it that brands like the Yorkshire Evening Post, really established media brands are trusted so much. And, you know, I think a lot of it is because we are the fabric of the community. You know, local journalism is really important to help people understand what's happening in the world around them. So with the pandemic, for example, when it comes to the announcements about tier three, or you just look at what happened over the weekend, people really want to know how is that going to impact them right here in Leeds? So, you know, they will go to multiple news sources. They'll look at the BBC, they'll look at Sky for the overall broad picture. But then when it comes to the real nuts and bolts of, well, what does this mean on my doorstep? How am I going to be affected? That's where trusted local journalism really comes into its own. Yeah. And so one thing that I've noticed that you've really done as well um, is not just um, 
kind of really establish this trusted brand that you've got but also kind of you're, you're shouting about the north you've got you're a campaigning editor and I've seen so many campaigns but you making a prominent stand about your title your journalists um, and doing that with um, campaigns like uh, it was it the one north campaign but then also um, you've got other campaigns um, which stand up against abuse against journalists as well so can you tell me a bit about your campaigning Yes, so I think, you know, when it comes to local journalism, people need to remember that we as journalists have a really vested interest in the communities that we serve. So we live here, we work here and we're really passionate about what we do. And I think that's why it's so important that we use our platforms to be able to campaign, to hold the power to account, to really champion our communities. And I think, you know, campaigning is really at the core of what a local news organization is all about so as you mentioned you know we've been shouting really loudly about how do we get a city like Leeds moving we all know that if you try to go from one side of the city to another certainly before the pandemic it was a nightmare so how do we get the best opportunities for Leeds so that was something in particular that we really sort of took a hold of and we got that bit between our teeth and in the end we ended up having the transport secretary come to our offices so we could give them a manifesto and a plan for what can we do to get leads moving again that just goes to show the power of journalism that we're able to effectively take that straight to the top and make our voices and leads voice heard um touching on our other campaigns obviously we've got our call it out campaign which is all about abuse that journalists face on social media um you know i won't lie when it comes to looking at harmful comments i could probably fill my entire newspaper each day with some of the comments that come through on our facebook page on twitter i mean one of my reporters you know was doing a live broadcast and somebody had the brass neck to say to our reporter who was simply just going about doing a job you know could she uh, go pick up six cans of beer and go make some lunch for him on the way home you know questioning her credentials and at the end of the day you would never ever ever go to anybody in the middle of the street or you know, who was going about doing their normal job, say, for example, in a supermarket and say to them, actually, what I think you're doing is really rubbish and I don't think you're up to the task. You would never do that. So why does it make it more acceptable when you can hide behind your keyboard, just tap out some hurtful words? And I don't think people realise the power that words have because, you know what, those comments, they do stick sometimes and it is tough. So actually, we decided as a title, we've had enough of this. And we're going to try and, I guess, clean up our social media pages, starting with calling out the abuse in the first place for what it is. It's wrong. Yeah. And with that as well, because obviously I think this is an issue that's being faced by journalists um, across the UK. It's being more talked about, I know, within academia and research um, is being done around that. And in fact, I think one of your reporters has been working with um, one of my colleagues um, contributing to that research um, but it really is a hot topic and you have talked about this and actually kind of spoken out vocally in terms of the industry haven't you and you've actually kind of put this campaign on the map um, and made it available for others to pick up as well and can I just ask is it do you think it's an issue particularly with female reporters or is it a wide-reaching issue um, that you see happening to everybody? I think it is a wide-reaching issue but I do genuinely believe that female reporters do bear the brunt of this. I mean, for example, when I announced my editorship a year ago, I mean, there was some there were some not very pleasant comments made where people just suddenly judge you on your appearance and what you look like. And actually, it's nothing to do with that. I've put in the graft. I've put in the blood, sweat and tears to get to where I've got to today. And I shouldn't have to turn around to somebody who wants to question my credentials and say, well, why have you got the job? I mean, it's just it's just outrageous, really. But I do think that female reporters do bear more so of this than male reporters, certainly from what we've seen in our newsroom. And I think a lot of it is because people do see women as, as easy targets and as easy pickings. But what we've realised is actually, you know, we are going to 
fight back and we are going to defend what we're doing. Yeah. Well, it's really good to see such positive action taking place against such negative things. So I um, really wish you all the best of luck with that campaign. Um, let's move on now and just talk about journalism in general, because obviously that's one small area that we've just talked about in terms of the challenges that journalism is facing. Journalism, um, you know, all over, not just regional, is is facing real challenges at the moment. Um, can you tell us a bit about some of those challenges and, and how you're managing them as a, as a news team? Absolutely. So when it comes to, I guess, the challenges that journalism faces, I mean, you just have to look at news organisations across the country in terms of having to reevaluate, I guess, what they do and how they do it. So one of the things that we've been particularly looking at and you'll have noticed with the Yorkshire Evening Post is uh, looking at the value of our content online so for for so long we have effectively given away our content for free online um, but what we've started to do now to certainly fund our journalism is look at asking people to subscribe and make that contribution towards our journalism so to place that same value that we place on our work digitally. So, you know, for for years, we've asked people to part with their cash for the newspaper. You know, people would leave the mills, go buy the paper, there'd be the green post outside the football grounds, and people would really put that value. So what we're asking people is to do that same kind of process, but with a different platform now. And actually what has been really nice to come out of this is people have got in touch with us to say, do you know what, we really value what you do. We really value the difference that you make to Leeds and to our lives. And actually you're right, we're going to pay for that. I mean, you know, there will always be those people who who won't part with their cash and that's their decision. But actually, you know, at the end of the day, we can't keep doing what we're doing for free. We have to find ways to sustain ourselves. And, you know, this is part of what we're doing. You look at other titles as well who are looking at, I guess, a more contributions-based model. Um, and actually what this is, I guess, made us do is just realise the importance of regional journalism in particular. Yeah, and you, you mentioned to me before about what, what might a landscape look like without without trusted journalism, without regional journalism, and obviously we're coming back to that point of trust again. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of journalism and the future of news? And, and you know, how can, we, how can we bring those audiences along with us? And it's about changing mindsets, a lot of it, isn't it? Because obviously what's happened in terms of the online, uh, publishing online, has been such a kind of slow process over 10 or, you know, 15 years now that actually we've got to change the mindset of that audience. And so, you know, what is the future of news in your opinion and how, how important is it? So I'll always remember at the sort of end of the year after the hospital story broke and um, one of the vicars in Leeds got in touch with me and he sent me a really lovely message to say that actually the deeper that people have dug and delved, they've unearthed nothing but integrity honesty and determination to do the right thing and I think those are the absolute cornerstone of when it comes to trusted news it is about that honesty it is about that integrity and it is about doing the right thing you know everything that we do is for the betterment of leads it's for championing and doing what we do best and having that accountability and if you think about you know not having those people there who are going to champion who are going to fight, who are going to shine the spotlight on them. You know, I think it's fair to say that our towns, our cities and our democracy would really be, I guess, a much poorer place without regional journalists there doing what they do best. And I think, you know, that's why it's so important for you as the next, I guess, cohort of that to, I guess, uphold those standards and look at how can you do that just as well. So really, that's a, quite an inspiring message to our students. Um, and just to, you know, ask you a little bit about your um, your background, because you were sitting in the seat of those students that are watching this now. 
really not in the grand scheme of things not all that long ago and now you're the editor of a daily news title you're putting Leeds in the north on the map with your campaigns with the stances that you're taking and you're really really pushing forwards for good quality valued journalism this is a huge achievement and really I guess you know can, can you share some top tips with um, those people that not that long ago you would have been sitting in amongst so it feels like a very long time ago, but I remember always saying to my parents when I grew up that I wanted to be a journalist. I was absolutely set on being a journalist from a young age. And I think they realised that with my drive and determination, I wasn't going to let it sort of die. So what we did, and I must have, I literally must have only been about 13. I wasn't very old. I got in touch with our local paper um, and it was I got my typewriter out and it's one of those typewriters where you're pressing the keys and you're getting your fingers stuck in between them and you feel battered and bruised after you've done a letter and I remember sending off a letter saying I'd really love to come into your newsroom and just look at how it works because I, I want to be a journalist and I remember getting a really lovely note back from the editor saying you know thank you so much for your interest we wish you all the best but we're really sorry you're a little bit young uh, at the moment so get in touch with us when you're older and I, I remember feeling a bit disappointed, but then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to keep at it. So I left it a year, got back in touch with him, and I don't think he quite expected me to get back in touch with him. But I think he then realised that I wasn't going to go anywhere until I'd come in and had a look round in the newsroom. And so they invited me in, I got to have a look round, and I genuinely felt like I was at home in the newsroom. And I remember going sort of, on Easter holidays, summer holidays, Saturdays, any chance that I could get to get my foot in the door just to soak up that experience and learn from the reporters around me. And actually it stood me in really good stead then because you know, before I even started at college, I had an entire cuttings book full of little nibs and book reviews and pets corners that I'd written. So it was really good for me. And also then it just meant that when I went into a newsroom people had known what I'd done before effectively so what I would say one of my top tips is when you do go for work experience do treat it like a job interview because you will be so surprised at how many people come to our newsroom on placement and actually they've got no ideas they just sit there wait for stuff to be given and that really doesn't leave a mark actually what we've found is the best people come in they're bursting with ideas they're ready to get stuck in, they'll turn their hand to anything. And actually it's those people that you remember. So then, you know, when the job opportunities come up, you'll think, oh, I remember them because they were brilliant when they came on placement or as happened with us, you know, we've had people who've come in on placement and they've been offered a job. So, you know, it's really treating that placement like a job interview. It's about working that shoe leather. It's about I guess being determined more than anything because I think that passion and that drive speaks a lot louder than you know the best qualifications in the world it's looking at somebody who lives and breathes local news it's you know looking at their innovative story ideas and it's really looking at you know how can that individual make a difference that's a great top tip and um just uh, in your opinion, because we've seen so much change, haven't we, in the way that journalism is produced and um, the different pressures facing journalists, but actually what are the uh, what are the key um, skills that you think still are absolutely vital within journalism that perhaps haven't changed? Well, I think the first one is having that that good nose to spot a story because you know it's it's looking at things like the local community groups because there are so many fantastic stories that have come out of those in particular certainly over the last couple of months you look at all the good work that organizations are doing to support one another under the pandemic um so i said the first one is that i guess that knows for a story it's it's having that inquisitive edge. It's all about going out and asking the questions. I think, you know, when it comes to being a journalist, it's it's been personal, isn't it, at the end of the day? It's about, you know, you will get put in some really tough situations. So, for example, you know, sadly, when people have died, you know, journalists will be expected to go on 
door knocks and you know the, it's not the best part of the job but actually being able to make that connection with somebody to get your foot in the door is a really is, is a skill in itself it's about you know how do you how do you get somebody to open up to share their life story with you and you know what it's a real privilege to be able to do that it's a real honor to be able to speak to people and share their stories with a much wider audience so I think they're probably two that I'd go for oh that's great thank you Laura and would you feel ready to take some questions from our live audience now yes that's let's do great. it so fire some questions over so uh we've got um from YouTube uh what are the main challenges you face as an editor of the Yorkshire Evening Post oh that's a great question I feel like I'm doing an entire list I think <laughs> I think the first one is, you know, being the editor of the Yorkshire Evening Post that bears a real weight of responsibility. So it's knowing that what you're putting out there serves a purpose and the right purpose, because I think it's all too easy for people to say, well, why have you published this or why have you done that? I think, you know, that's the biggest challenge in that, you know, it's taking that responsibility really seriously. Yeah. That sounds great. Oh, we've got another one here. So from Lauren um, on YouTube, what do you expect of your reporters in your newsroom? For example, being reliable, etc. So reporters in my newsroom, I think the first thing is it's really important that they see themselves as part of the team. And I think that team ethos is really important in a newsroom. Um, you know, it's about that camaraderie. It's about looking out for each other and it's about supporting each other because I think, you know, newsrooms work best when they're in collaboration. So it's really looking for someone who is that reliable team player more than anything. I think also what I'd come to expect is I'd want somebody who I can rely on because at the end of the day, you know, I rely on reporters to do the digging, to do the legwork and to come to the pass with stories that are sound. And if I can't trust you to do that job, then there's really not much point of you being there, quite frankly. I think, you know, it's having a really reliable uh, person who you can turn to. So for example, if a boy on the hospital floor story happens again, I know that that reporter who did the legwork did a really really solid job and i didn't even have to question that ability at all yeah so it's knowing that you can that your reporters are going to put the real legwork in then mm -hmm. oh we've got another one just coming in from samantha um so on youtube how difficult is it to turn a sens sensitive story around quickly while retaining trust and accuracy great question that's a really good question so when i look at the story that I've just spoken about, do you know what, actually, that wasn't a story that you could turn around quickly. And sometimes it is about giving that story the breathing space that it needs to make sure that you have done the checks and the balances, because there would be nothing worse than feeling like we had to turn something around incredibly quickly and damage that trust at the same time, because, you know, something like that trust can easily be lost at the click of a button and it's really hard to win back. So I think, you know, when it comes to stuff that is sensitive, I'd rather they spend the extra time to actually get the facts and get everything that we need rather than feeling like we've got to just rush it out. But you know what, there are examples where you look at incidents that have happened, breaking incidents, and we do have to react really quickly, but it's just keeping those values in the back of our mind as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, I mean, those challenges, the, the pressure of um, news now is there, isn't it? And you've got, you've got competition, um, you want people to come and look at your product, but yeah, that balance between speed and, uh, and uh, accuracy and verification is so important, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I think we have a couple more questions and do keep sending your questions in because we have a bit more time. So, you know, do pop a question in if you've not had the chance to do that already. Um, so we've got one from Liam on Facebook here, which is, hi, Laura. What qualities do you think make up an ideal journalist? Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. So um, the ideal journalist, I feel like you almost need to have a little bit of a toolkit, don't you, when you're the ideal journalist. So I would suggest things like, 
having that genuine genuine I guess being nosy for a start that's the first <laughs> thing. um always sort of having that that question in the back of your mind about why and what next and what does this mean you know I think journalists are just very inquisitive creatures by their very nature so they like to ask they like to delve so I think that's probably the first thing I'd say the second thing is about having that really nice rapport that you can build up with people who you speak to because you know I think what it's worth noting is that you want somebody to effectively tell you their life story in a short space of time so it's been able to have that rapport and build it up with someone from the offset and really build up that trust because I think when it comes to contacts you never quite know when you're going to need them and it's leaving that I guess good impression on people because then they're likely to say to their friends oh well I spoke to so and so at such and such and they did this so then if there's another story that comes up they'll remember you and go straight back to you then rather than thinking oh well who do I get in touch with it's building up that rapport building up that contacts is incredibly important um I'd say also it's down to as we mentioned earlier that reliability and having someone who you can rely on to get the story right um, and accuracy I think is incredibly important too and I think you know it just goes back to that whole sense of being a team player too because you know newsrooms are very much a team environment we support each other you know we deal with some incredibly difficult stories so it's knowing that you've got your colleagues there that when you are having a little bit of a flat day that somebody's there to help pick you up at the end of the day Thank you for that, Lauren. I think we've got a couple more questions coming in now. Um, so from Noah uh, on YouTube, when you have possible stories sent in or see them on social media, how do you decide what's worth the time to follow up and what's likely rubbish? That's a great question because we get lots and lots and lots of stories coming into our news desk day in, day out. I think, you know, a lot of it does go back to that news sense. It's almost like, I guess like a bit of a sixth sense in that you'll just have a hunch if there's something worth following up and do you know what sometimes you get stories that come in that seem really dry on the surface and you think is this going to be worth our time and actually once you've spoken to that individual the story turns out to be something completely different and an even better story than what you'd first envisioned. So sometimes it is just worth putting in that little bit of legwork just to see what that line is, because more often than not, I think it's so easy to go into a story and prejudge the line that you think it's going to take, whereas actually it can take a really different turn as you're going along. So, you know, it is worth investing that time. I think when it comes to things like council reports, for example, I mean, there could be pages and pages and pages that you have to see. And more often than not, you'll find that little gold nugget right at the end. So it is about sticking with it. And I guess going back to that inquisitive nature of being a journalist, it's always just asking the question. And I guess you'll get some things that come through that are just clearly probably not worth your time. So, you know, it might be advertising or it might be just something. I remember when I was working in newsrooms around Christmas time, the number of press releases you'd get that were completely and utterly inconsequential. You had to wade through them to get to the really good stuff. Mm, definitely, definitely. Um, so we've got another one um, from YouTube um, and it's Sam and how difficult has it been working in the industry industry sorry throughout the pandemic oh that is a brilliant question so do you know what I won't lie it's been incredibly tough so as soon as we had wind of the first lockdown we made the decision to as you can see take our newsrooms into our homes so since March, we've all been working remotely. Um, so we've been working from our spare bedrooms, from our kitchen tables, from our bedrooms, you name it. And that has been really tough to, I guess, keep that collaboration of the newsroom that we're so passionate about. I think we've had to find different ways of communicating with ourselves. So I don't think I've ever been on as many Zoom and Hangout meetings in my life as I have been over the last six months. But 
it's trying to keep that sense of connectedness has been incredibly important to me. And, you know, when it comes to looking at things like placements, do you know what? We've had to do them a little bit differently this year. We have had to look at virtual placements and we appreciate that, you know, students won't get the same experience that they would have got in the newsroom with everybody around. But we're really conscious that we want to still make that experience open to people. I think the toughest thing for us as journalists and reporting on the pandemic is there has been a sense of don't shoot the messenger at times. So since March, you know, my team have been reporting day in, day out on the, you know, awful figures that come out from the hospital around the number of deaths or the people who've been admitted. And you know what, that really does take its toll. I challenge anybody to say that it doesn't take its toll on them when you're reporting at the end of the day you know we're only human as well and while there have been some incredibly tough moments like that you know we then do get people accusing us of scaremongering but actually as a local organization we've got a responsibility to accurately report what's happening in our city so again that that does take its toll but I think it's also worth mentioning you know there's a real I guess positive side to this in that we have been able to really celebrate all of our key workers on the front line you know we've printed hundreds and hundreds of pictures of our doctors our nurses our bin men you name it across Leeds we've also you know made a pledge that we're going to be there with you every step of the way you know we joined with regional titles across the country to make that pledge when that first happened and that's something that you know we do take incredibly seriously and I think the really nice thing to come off the back of this is the fact that you know what we've seen is cities communities towns coming together in a way to support each other like they never have done before you know you just walk down the street and the neighbors say hello whereas before this happened people kind of just kept themselves to themselves and we've seen some absolutely incredible I guess acts of kindness come out of this so you know it's been a real privilege to be able to report those as well that's great. And I believe we have a question coming in from John Wilson. So John Wilson, who you used to work with, obviously, who's now actually um, teaching law to our first years at the moment and doing various other things for us, too. And he says, morning, Laura, do you think regional daily papers will be completely online in the next few years? Oh, John, it's so nice to hear from you. You helped me get through my exams. And um, so I think there's a real place for print. I think, you know, people really do still cherish that printed product. And I think we saw that really profoundly uh, when Leeds United got promoted. So for the first time that I can remember, we had to actually do a print rerun of our We Are The Champions paper because actually the demand far outstrips the supply. And I'll be honest, in my career, I've never known an opportunity where we've actually had to stoke the printers back up again. And what was really nice on the back of that was people were saying that they were keeping the papers in a box for their sort of children and their grandchildren. They'd framed the front page. And there was, I guess, there's this real nostalgia around that print product. And I think, you know, people do still cherish that. People do still want the feel of print. And I think when you look at certainly what's happened with the world around us, when you look at the pandemic, you know, there are people who don't have access online. There are people who aren't digitally connected. And actually that newspaper more often than not is the only thing that they've got giving them advice about what's happening in the world around us. And I remember one reader getting in touch with me when lockdown first happened and she said thank you. And the reason why she said thank you is because she was able to take a newspaper, have a cup of tea, have a biscuit and fill in the crossword. And actually, she thanked me for that because that gave her just that moment to escape and forget about what was going on around her. And it just makes you, I guess, value that even more. That's great. Thanks so much. And I think we do have a couple more questions. So we've got one from Jessica Bailey on Facebook, which says, hi, Laura, do you think the role of journalists has changed over recent years or even since the pandemic? And if so, how? Great question. Really good question. 
I genuinely don't think it has. I think, you know, the the whole ethos of being a journalist is all about, you know, it is holding power to account. It is celebrating and championing the communities. It is about shining a spotlight on what is happening in the world around. And I think, you know, they're, they're almost like the, I guess, like the cornerstone and the foundations of journalism. And I think if we've got those as, a foundation we've got an incredibly solid foundation that we can continue to keep building on in the years to come and I think we have time for one more question so hit us with it it's a long one <laughs> it's Liam uh, on Facebook hi Laura I graduated from Trinity in 1994 and have worked in public relations and communications since then do you think that the development of social media and online journalism means that modern reporters now have to consider how a story will generate web traffic improved analytics for potential advertisers etc if so how do you think this balances against traditional journalistic objectivity that is a great question isn't it I think yeah. you know it all just goes back to that point about you know, people want to know what's happening in the world around them. And I think the really interesting development in journalism is actually we've now got the analytics and the tools to be able to see what our readers are looking at more so than we've ever had before. You know, I think initially you'd go on a, a hunch that you think this story might be worth covering or you'd perhaps look at, say, for example, some postcode analysis of where the newspaper sells but you never actually really were able to get into I guess the guts of what it is that people value in particular and I think what's really interesting now with our analytics is we're able to see you know not only uh, what stories people are reading but we can tell how long that they're reading for what the makeup of that audience looks like and actually it's absolutely fascinating to be able to use that so I guess guide some of your decisions as well, because I think, you know, more often than not, people might say, well, why is this relevant? And you look at it and you think, well, you know, 30,000 people were looking at that. It shows an interest within that. I think, you know, what's really important is we've never been as well informed to see how our content works. And I think, you know, it's not just looking at the overall, I guess, number of clicks anymore it's looking at that wider picture. So it's looking at, you know, what kind of content really engages with a loyal audience who keep coming back to that. It's looking at, well, what kind of content, for example, do our subscribers want to read? And actually, they're all different metrics and it's looking at how do you pull that into the wide as well. So there's a lot to keep your eye on there, isn't there? And a lot to kind of, uh, the technologies and the way that things change, that's probably one of the biggest challenges of journalism, isn't it? It's uh, keeping up with that and picking the important things. Absolutely. I remember when I first started as a journalist, the most technological thing we did was have a giant camera and a tripod and we all got training on how to shoot video. And you look at the world now, you know, we've all got smartphones in our pockets. We've got access to things that we've never had before. And it's just incredible, I guess, how much the industry has changed over the last 13 years. And you think, what's the industry going to look like in another couple of years? And actually, that's quite exciting. Yeah, great opportunities there. And can you tell me, we've got just a, one more minute left. Um, so could you tell me, just as a final point then, what are your top tips, your final top tips for journalists or final pieces of advice for those students that are going into that future that we've just talked about? I think it's making sure that you never stand still. I think it's always looking to what is the next thing and how can I carve out my niche and what can I look at to specialise in particular? So, for example, you know, you look at Twitter, you look at Facebook, you look at Instagram, you look at TikTok. There's so many new things that keep coming up onto the um, platform horizon. So I guess it's looking at, you know, what are the new things? How do you make sure that you're on top of it? Because at the end of the day, do you know what? All of our newsrooms need an expert in these things. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of different areas to look at. So I think one, it's keeping an eye on, I guess, the technology that's come in um, and how you can be an expert in that field. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, it just boils down to someone who has that passion and that drive for news. You've got to live and breathe news if you're a journalist. 
That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Laura. And thank you for giving your time and helping us kick off what's going to be a really, really exciting week here at Leeds Trinity University. We've got some amazing talks coming up throughout the week. Um, and do make sure that you, if you're watching this, you uh, click on the next link, which is going to be Chris Hitchens, uh, the digital producer at uh, Channel 4. And he'll be ready to take your questions after um, chatting with Jenny Keane. So thanks so much, Laura. Um, it's been lovely to see you. Oh, thank you so much for having me and I hope I was useful. <laughs> More than useful. <laughs>